Storm and can uh, move along. Okie dokie. Uh, now I lost my place. <laughs> Here we go. Okie dokie. So we have uh, the release taxonomy discussion followed by uh, review uh, uh, and final approval, hopefully, of Bawa's proposal for a Hyperledger PY uh, Python um, SDK. Um, then Todd will go over the Hackfest preparations. Um, Brian and Todd will talk about the wiki, and hopefully everybody's had a chance to play with it or um, at least uh, take a look and get familiar. And then there's another update on communication tools from Brian. And, um, and then we'll have work group updates. I'd like to add one more thing, Todd, uh, at the end of the, or I guess between action items and, and work group updates, and that is um, um, uh, just a, a reminder um, about the um, uh, and an update around the uh, the collaboration around the blockchain explorer. <clears throat> That's it. Unless anybody has any other items they like to add. Okay. Um, so first up is the release taxonomy, and I was just going through and noticing and get a chance to that there was a bunch of comments. So um, for those of you, and I think everybody who's commented is on, so maybe we should just go through them and, um, and review. Is everybody okay with that? Yep. I'll go with a yes then. Okay, so the first one was from Dan, sent in just two seconds ago. Assume these are optional and not required. Um, the uh, tags? Yes. All right. Um, so the, the first thing is I think we discussed last week um, on Slack, there was some discussion about using developer preview or not um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a tag. Um, and I'm I'm a little bit torn. I think you, you probably need something to indicate the the status. I wouldn't want a, just a naked release out there and somebody thinking that it's real or you know not in some sort of a pre-release state, even though it may have been released. Uh, not not pre sort of a pre-general availability kind of a state. Um, I. I just like to get other people's uh, thoughts on that. We could maybe shorten it to be dev prev or something, but. Uh, I think yeah, I think that the the thing that had come up, and I don't remember the the details, unfortunately, was some of the the tooling. Um, uh, there there's some obstacle to including kind of freeform text like that rather than just using numeric values. Um, right, I think it was something to do with dashes. Um, I, I haven't seen anything and. Like I said, I did a bunch of research on other projects, and they all seem to be using hyphenated appendages. I, I mean, I, I'm willing to say that this is a, a general set of guidelines that we, we should follow. I don't, I don't know if we, and then Brian, I don't know what you think, but um, I'm not necessarily wedded to thou shalt absolutely positively, because if we may have a project join that doesn't do this, and I wouldn't want to be in a situation where we're trying to make them change how they how they do their stuff. But this is a set of, as they would say in the um, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, these are a set of guidelines, right, <laughs> that we can follow. Um, I think I think uh, it, it's somewhere between strongly encouraged and required for me. Um, you know, I think it's about consistent communication, about making mm -hmm. sure that somebody familiar with one project can can easily go to the next. Um, you know, I think yeah, I think if, if there was a project that was resistant, then we we should probably talk about uh, you know evolving the taxonomy. Um, but uh, I, somewhere somewhere around strongly encouraged for me. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think the intent is that the the numeric means are still consistent across the projects, and uh, assuming that there's a way around whatever the the technical limitations were on on dashes or or alpha characters, then there's no 
there's no substantive disagreement from from the uh, Sawtooth project. So should I change this to say something like strongly encouraged to use the following tags, Brian? That's probably probably the right thing. Or strongly encouraged. Yeah. I don't know exactly the wording, but I think it has to be along the lines of this is what you should use unless you have really good reason not to. So something along the line of should is, the, I think, what we are looking for. Right, except that we're avoiding the all caps yelling <laughs> of <most> standards. <laughs> OK, I, uh, I changed it to is also strongly encouraged that projects should use the following tags as permitted by December. Yeah, and then uh, projects that fall behind are left behind. Unless you just really wanted to get away from your uh, your Pirates of the Caribbean reference. <laughs> yeah, good one. Okay. Um, next one was from Hart Y six. Uh, I agree. It should be seven. I miscounted. Um, okay. Uh, so I changed that. Um, and then the next one was from Brian, uh, who says it's the SHA-256, and I just checked Git, says it's the SHA-1 hash. Oh, okay. My mistake. Um, SHA-1, it's the same SHA-1. Yeah. Okay. Um, next up was Greg, suggests using snapshot, yada, 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 which is both a common, well-understood nomenclature. Uh, okay. I'm going I think to go part with that. Of, reading that again, Chris, I think there's a higher level discussion, which is, you know, what is what is this thing that we're attacking? Because there's, there's releases, and then there's this like you know, state of the tree or nightly build kind of thing. And I, I I always look at it from the perspective of the only thing that's a release is something that has a first class Simver tag that a release engineer or whoever's in charge of you know bumping that set out there, and and that's the only you know, release and anything else is a nightly build kind of thing. So I guess that's the first thing we should resolve is, are you are you uh, going for uh, the more formal release kind of thing, which might include the, you know, the SHA, or is this uh, more of the nightly build scenario kind of thing? So I'm thinking, and, and I've been sort of thinking also about the, just the whole process for doing releases, um, but I'm thinking that we would have, you know, periodic releases some of which we would consider to be stable um, and suitable for public consumption that may not be a formal release, right? But, you know, we this is the product of a given sprint or what have you. Um, and that, um, you know, those may... Um, uh, that those may be uh, interspersed with periodic unstable builds that people are, you know, I mean, a lot of projects tend to put out even the unstable build for some people to, to be able to pull down and play with, um, but that we should, between what's stable and what's unstable. Um, Agreed. And I, I, think, I think that separation is definitely important and should be captured. The only concern I would have about anything that's construed as a uh, somewhat formal release, even if it's an intermediate, is that the SHA stuff doesn't play well with that in terms of, you know, uh, versioning uh, yeah. packaging systems and whatnot, so that would be my only concern there. You know, the set, the Semver tag plays perfectly with it, but when you start throwing Git hashes in there, that they have no, uh, mm. you know, way to evaluate which one's newer. This is true. Um... Okay, we could we could omit that then. I don't have a problem with that. Um, it's just that even for our own internal testing and so forth, we probably want to have a really clear idea about which build we're dealing with. 
Well, I, I think at the very least, you know, if, if there is that aspect, like I said when I wrote that, I was thinking the nightly build scenario, and I, I think that the snapshot kind of thing makes a lot of sense for the nightly build scenario. So I, you know, maybe that's captured as a second subclause of that, uh, you know, as a different paragraph to what you were just talking about there. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of these, like, intermediate releases, um, you know, it's just decide. I think it makes sense, but in my mind, it, you know, you know, why mess around? If it's a new release, make it 061 or 062, whatever. It, it, I guess it, it's kind of hard, because I, I, I know what you're going for. Like, you, you, you're saying, well, there's there might be some merit in something more formal than the nightly build, but it's not quite an 061. Is there a way to capture that? You know, do we right. just... That's right. Just, I'm, yeah, I'm going for something in between a release. Right. So I wonder, um, I wonder, you know, would it be better to be like 0601 as, as opposed to 060 with a shy, you know, that, that kind of thing, or, or is that too, still too formal? I think that's still too formal, and um, I mean, I guess like an 061 and then latest, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I was going for something that's like, we, it, it's, it's, you know, it's in a branch, it's, it's, it's still evolving. Um, but we do want some people to pull it and test it, and then we need to be able to sort of clearly make an association back to exactly which one they're talking about, right, if there are multiples of these things. For what it's worth, I mean, I've seen this kind of thing in other other systems like Maven coordinates, and, that, and they use the snapshot for that. that so that, okay. so that, they, you know, that, that, that just designates that it's a moving target that represents some state of the tree that's in in queue to be whatever the, for, the okay. first level. So we would do this, it wouldn't necessarily be published. Right. Um, certainly not to any, you know, uh, Docker hubs or anything like that, but we may have it, you know, available for people to just sort of pull and... Right. And just, and just to be clear, you, you could push those to Docker hub if you wanted to, it's just, it's just going to... We could, but it would be very polluted, yeah. Right. <laughs> it would be compatible, just not be I, I could go with Snapshot. I could, I could, I could do that. Okay, so for subsequent builds, then subsequent, I would say, for subsequent releases of a tag release, obviously it would go from 0.6 to 0.6.1, um, uh, but for interim builds, uh, we'll go with snapshot. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. All right, I'll fix that up later. Um, Chris, I had a Ryan. quick follow-up question about that. Yeah. I assume it's I assume it's uh, obvious or explicit, but somebody's always going to be able to grab this tag and recreate the build straight straight from the versioning system, right? So uh, we're we're telling we're somewhere we're saying this is actually going to be used as one of the tags you can use to extract. I think it would be something that's a product of a build, and Greg, correct me if you think otherwise, but so that if somebody did a local build for a particular um, for a particular commit level, it would be reflected. Um, we did talk about whether, and then we also talked about doing something so that if you're doing a local build, um, indicating whether or not there's any un committed changes, although that's, that could be trickier. Um, so, yeah, the, so I mean, I think, I, Jeremy, I think you, to your point you were, you were getting at, if I did a local build of a given commit level, it would produce the same uh, tagged version as if we were to do that out of a, you know, out of our Jenkins build. Is that right? Yeah, that's essentially my question is if somebody sees this tag set, can they recreate right. the build? Um, because it's a, yeah. it's a, um, the, the assumption here is, is not just that we need to use this to communicate uh, um, some sort of uh, understanding of the state of this thing, but also that we can, uh, it's re- how easy it is to reproduce. So my, my thoughts there are that for, for for formal releases, that's you know absolutely positively has to be nailed down to a concrete rep spec. Um, that, you know, so 06 developer preview 
is going to be a tag, right? And that's reproducible. And then from the perspective of the nightly builds, it can go either way. Most systems I've seen tend to just say snapshot, and it's kind of like it's the latest of, of the development for the, the projected release, you know, projected next release. And you can't necessarily pin it from the version number to uh, a specific uh, commit. I think we've gone one step further and said, okay, well, we are going to attach a shot, a shot to that so that we can correlate it to a, a specific commit if we want to, at least within reason. As Chris pointed out, uh, we, you know, we would need an extra level of detail if this was, you know, truly the commit level, or if you had local changes, which we don't currently capture in the in the fabric side. Um, so it's it's a question of how important it is. It, most subsystems I've dealt with don't seem to care too much. It's it's supposed to be an ephemeral snapshot, but we can do better than that if we think that's important. Well, I was I was just thinking in terms of if if somebody pulls down a build, they find what they think is a bug, they post something on the Slack or the emails. Um, it could be that we just ask them to recreate it with the most recent one, or somebody. Could, Who's trying to help could go and pull it if if they had a if they had if they knew say the snapshot number, right? And, and that's and that's where the shot comes in, right? So that if we if we add an additional component to the to the tag, which includes the shot, we at least have some semblance of hope of figuring out where it came from uh, right. when they report the version number. And I and I think that's pretty cheap to add. Um, the the only extra level of complexity is you know whether it's truly that commit level or had local changes. And, and even that's not that hard. I just I, I couldn't get it to work in a short time frame, so I gave up, but I, I think it's achievable. And uh, you know, obviously if they if their build indicates they had local changes, we can't necessarily say, well these were the changes you had, but we can at least know that it wasn't, you know, what the SHA implies. Exactly, and that's probably good enough. Right. Okay. Um all right, so I'll clean that part of it up. Um, should be an N for RCN. I'm not sure where this goes. Oh, I see. Add one. Yes, okay, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, Arno had the next one. I find the unclosed state terminology clunky, open state. Okay, um, I'm okay with that. That's obviously minor editorial stuff. So. Yep. Um, uh, Jeremy, is throughput latency performance at risk? We want to characterize. Alpha. I don't know. Yeah, I, I want to reopen the the prior uh, risk risk management discussion, but that I, that was just the where that question was coming from. Um, Just a question of what what expectations are we managing towards? Right. Is this this imply this this um, as written, currently written would suggest uh, performance as opposed to uh, say hard, hard suggestion around the the security flaws um, and uh, the, I guess the question is the risk to whom is it the risk to the reputation of the project? Or is it a risk to those who use the release? Because those are two different groups. I, I think um, I think it's probably. I mean, I think from from a nomenclature perspective, you know, maybe we can omit this. But I do think, you know, to your point, Jeremy, that we probably do want to make sure that there's clear set of um, published expectations that one might have from an alpha, right? I mean, we may want to publish it, and it may be slow as molasses, but it does everything we, we proclaim it to do. 
and we understand what the problem is and we're going to fix it in the beta kind of a thing, right? And so we might go out and just set the expectations that, well, this will only achieve 500 a second or whatever uh, throughput. Um, we understand what the problem is and we're going to address that in subsequent releases, but this is suitable for testing. Um, I think as long as we are clear on setting expectations when we do a release, that we will be covered. But I, I mean, again, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily say, well, we can't put an alpha out because it's slow. Yeah, right? no, no, no professional. Agreed. Agreed. What, what do Agreed. others think? I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to just sort of make, <laughs> I don't want to be too uh, dictatorial here. I understand where you're coming from. I think it's important that we set that expectation. I'm just wondering if it's worthwhile putting in here from a nomenclature perspective as predetermining the expectations for what costs, what constitutes an alpha. Chris, um, just the, uh, <clears throat> is there a reason why you're specifically pulling performance out here as opposed to, I mean, performance, security, and th there's a bunch of sort of minimal criteria that have been discussed in different forums about. That's right, and so this is Jeremy's, it's not mine. Um, um, you know, we, we had that, that conversation, uh, yeah. I guess, a couple of weeks ago. Thought we beat um, that one to death. I thought we did too, but I, again, I don't, um, I don't know, Jeremy, do you think, that is there a reason the performance would, you know, if, if we started enumerating all these things, and I think we get back into the whole characterization of what can be released and so forth. Um, oh, right, right, exactly. And so I think the easiest thing to do would be to say it needs the, you know, it's been, it uh, is how well we think it, it's been tested against the requirements that have been enumerated, whatever those may be, functional, non-functional. Um, because I think what you're just implying is just, uh, it's uh, just how much confidence or process has gone into it. So the easiest thing to do is just to say how uh, something to the effect of how much we think it's, how close we think it's to doing what it's, it's as you said, you say it's doing. How about if we just change this to say so that POCs can be done within the bounds of um, established, um, published, uh, rather, uh, expectations. Perfect. That sounds good. Kidoki. I think, uh, aside from resolving Oops, I clicked the wrong one, Jeremy. <laughs> um, oh, I, I kept the other good one. So I think there's just that one bit that I need to noodle on in terms of the uh, uh, the snapshot release. So uh, I'll do that, and then what we can do is I'll just circulate this, and we can do an email uh, agreement. Um, Okie doke. Uh, next up is uh, the... Uh, Oh, and feel free to any typos, obviously. Um, okay, thank you, everyone. Next up is the Hyperledger Pi uh, SDK for the fabric. Um, Todd, can you ping the link to that in the... Yep, one sec. Thanks. I, I always want to go click on <laughs> the little viewer. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. Thanks. Bawa, are you on? Yes, I'm out. Awesome. Okay, so hopefully people have had a chance to um, have a look, review, and comment. See a couple from Morali, Peter, and Bawa. It looks like you've addressed the two, or no, one of them anyway. Um, so, um, what do people think? Is this ready for approval? Do people want more time to review? Any concerns? 
think one of the things that we had asked Balois to do was to go back and see what additional um, uh, support he could garner to help um, uh, and to sort of uh, to augment from a development perspective to get additional people to commit to to helping with the development. I don't know, Bawa, did you get a chance to get any feedback on that? Yes, actually I got uh, several feedbacks and uh, I also asked people to send me the CV, uh, their written and uh, after checking I select uh, those four people uh, two also from IBM and uh, the other two, uh, one is from Nice Skill and uh, another one from uh, the Zhejiang University is the with a student. I guess uh, all these four people are very uh, exciting to support this project. Okay. And and uh, in terms of. Um, how the project proceeds. Um, my understanding is this is sort of being uh, is going to then follow the uh, there's a I guess between the Python, the, the Java, the Node, and I think a Go proposal uh, sort of in the wings, um, where everybody's collaborating on a um, sort of a, a specification for the um, for the SDK. And so I'm, I'm, I trust that the intention here is that if we start this project, that it'll follow whatever we all collectively agree to as the sort of the, the, the framework for the SDK. Okay. Hey, um, uh, hey, uh, Chris. This is Morali from DDCC. So just want to clarify. So. The RESTful, even though the initial version of the Python SDK is uh, will have some RESTful API invocations, mm -hmm. but later on will be replaced by gRPC. Is that the the thought process there? It's going to have to because the REST APIs are eventually okay. going away. So. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that that that's the intention, uh, Morali. Uh, Mawa, I, I believe that you are also part of that SDK working group, right? I mean, it's right. not a formal working group, but a number of folks get together, led by folks from DTCC, Morali, and, and all. Um, so I, I guess this this would be one of the implementation then, um, Chris. Um, that's the, yeah, that's I what I was trying to get clarify on, uh, clarity yeah. on, rather. Yeah, okay. So I, I think we should de-emphasize the REST support here and, uh, you know, start looking to to one O uh, instead and yeah. focus more on gRPC. Why don't, what, 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 why don't we do this? Um, so, Bella, I, I mean, I, I assume because you are part of that uh, informal working group, um, can you just update this to reflect that the Python SDK will follow the you know, whatever we collectively agree to as the um, the specification for the SDKs, um, as opposed to specifics about REST or gRPC, we just sort of say that the, you know this 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 this, this uh, SDK will follow the 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 guidance from the uh, the SDK working group. Let's just call it for that, for lack of a better term. Uh, yes, actually, the initial implementation of the project is based on the RESTful API. Uh, while if you uh, if if you look at the project code now, you can find there are several branch named uh, the RESTful one and the, the also the gRPC one. So, uh, respectively, they will implement it on different uh, ways. While uh, the community now more and more people think uh, GRPC one is more flexible. So maybe uh, we can uh, put more uh, effort to the GRPC implementation. Okay, but what all I was really asking is to, in the proposal itself, just to replace the discussion of REST or GRPC and just say that you'll follow the. Uh, approach agreed to by the the SDK working group. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have to follow the spec after, after we have finished. Yeah, it. right. Okay, that, that's all I'm asking. And so, so you have, uh, yeah. sounds like, four or five uh, people interested in contributing. That's good. Um, and it's a diverse community. That's a good thing. Um, and um, so I, I, I guess we could put it to a vote. Todd, you want to run a roll? Yeah, uh, there was just one chat from Dan Middleton uh, that said the only remaining comment was around the project naming. I don't know if we we tackled that. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think we should um, make it, uh, you know, Fabric PY rather than Hyperledger PY. Hello. Or fa fabric Client PY maybe. Uh huh. Um, I'm in Raleigh, so Chris, uh, I'll call Cheryl and have her call. I, I think Chris got pulled away. <laughs> Forgot to go on mute. <laughs> um, Bawa, any objections? To I'm in Raleigh, so uh, I will have Fabric Cheryl. Client .py? Yeah. I don't think so. Uh, uh, okay. All right. <laughs> Some moderator can mute Chris. Uh, yeah, I just muted him. Um, uh, uh, it looks like Bawa, you suggested Fabric SDK APY. Um, is that better or worse than Fabric Client PY? I'm not sure. Um, Fabric SDK API sounds good to me. So are we going with API or SDK? I think we should stick SDK. to okay. SDK. Okay. Looks like Dan and Greg are also plus one on Fabric SDK API. Okay. Looking at the comments in the doc. I don't know if Chris has returned yet or not. Um, sorry, I uh, I had to take a call and I was muted. Um, I'm back. Um, discussing the name the top, at the top. I oh, I see. Yeah, changing that to like Fabric SDK PY. Uh, that sounds good to me. Okay. Do you want to edit? Do you want me to? I'm happy to edit it. Oh, it looks like I only have suggesting role. I don't have actual editing. Okay. Mess that up. Is that, um, uh, Chris, I don't know if you have actual editing on the doc. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm suggesting two. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, we'll go with maybe it. Maybe can. <clears throat> somebody will have to go through and edit the other references, but um, right, are we all good? In the doc. No, Apologies, okay. I had to drop off for a second there, but are we all good? I couldn't. I didn't get the the results. Uh, we didn't vote. Oh, we didn't vote. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I thought a bunch of us already voted in the uh, chat. Oh. Yeah, so I, I can walk through really quickly now. I think we still have quorum, even though Dan dropped. Uh, so I'll just do a quick quick run through. Uh, so Arno. He says yes. yes. Oh, okay. Uh, ben. Yes. Chris. Yep. Greg. Yep. Hart. Yep. Mick. Yes. Morali. Yes. Tamash. All right. Uh, so that passes unanimously. Okay. I'll uh, have Rai set up a, a project and. Um, and I'll uh, I'll ping you about why, where you can pour it into. Okay. Uh, next up, 
is Eve Hackfest. Yep, uh, just really quick update for that. Uh, the Hackfest is confirmed. It's in Amsterdam, October 3rd and 4th. We do have a registration page now live, so if you're planning to attend that, uh, please register as soon as possible. Uh, I'll send the link out again with the uh, minutes that'll go out later today. Uh, in addition, there will also be a hackathon that weekend, October 1st and 2nd, uh, also in Amsterdam, slightly different location. Uh, and as soon as that registration page is live, we'll certainly share it out with the community. That's that. Could we also have a uh, wiki page that folks could tear up some big um, agenda items. Yeah, we can do. We we do have a wiki that's up next for a discussion. Right. Yeah, I think in the past we've done a Google Doc that people can uh, dump information into for agenda planning. Is that what you're talking about, Ben? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yes. Okay, I will get one created and and send a link out with the minutes as well. Cool. Um, okay, next up, uh, Jesus. This is so annoying. Hello. Here we go. It's the uh, wiki, the wiki migration. It's the wiki discussion, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, this is Brian. Um, you know, we, we stood up a test wiki on Thursday. It may have been the end of summer, Labor Day thing, et cetera, for, for many of us, but, uh, I know I didn't get a chance to, to work with it as much as I would have liked, um, and I, I, we had a few, uh, you know, a few people touching it. But um, I would suggest we uh, try to take another week to uh, give folks uh, on the TSC and, and and elsewhere a chance to, to get their hands dirty with it before we commit. Um, uh, but uh, I, mean, I haven't heard any complaints so far, except for I'm sorry, Jeremy, you did. You did uh, have a negative experience trying to copy some content over, didn't you? Um, well, I, I I wouldn't characterize it as a complaint. It's just an observation. It's not cut and it's not cut and paste. It's pretty. <laughs> I wasn't uh, blaming. I didn't. Pretty pretty uh, simple, but I uh, I moved over one of the complex wiki pages and uh, documented what I had to change to get it to work. Um, and that's presumably going to be the. Uh, because it's more one of the more complicated ones. Presumably, everything else would be easier. Um, and just as an observation, I, I did a Git dump of the of the existing Hyperledger Hyperledger repo wiki, uh, supposed to say the Fabric wiki, and there are probably 110 pages, uh, some of which we can move, some of which we can uh, just leave. I think it might make sense to leave behind. So this is this is Greg. I, I I don't have a strong opinion about this. This is just my comments. I I, I tried bringing a page over yesterday just for the uh, experience uh, playing with it, and I wasn't overly blown away. Although I you know still haven't really given it a fair chance to understand the different nuance of the interface and whatnot. But I I guess what I was curious of is my experience was similar. I I, I dumped the original GitHub wiki and and tried to port a page over, and then I basically had to rework. Uh, almost all the syntax it wasn't compatible so I'm just kind of curious like what why did we choose this one was there something were there others evaluated and we picked this one for a certain reason uh, or, or is it just we picked one randomly because maybe there's one that's more compatible with the github markdown than what we have uh, currently yeah this is uh, so there's a set of wikis that the Linux foundation IT department is willing to support um, it was this and I believe uh, it was told at one point it, it, that that Confluence was supported, but then um, it was uh, suggested that instead of Confluence, by the Linux Foundation IT department, that we go to DocuWiki instead. Um, uh, uh, and uh, um, that's been a little opaque to me. Um, uh, now there is a Markdown module of, uh, that installed on this, and I don't know how to invoke it. I don't know if it's uh, like a set of tags that you use at the beginning or at the end of the stretch of content that you paste into the the, the edit window, but um, uh, there is some documentation available for that when I was looking at it before. Um, uh, so I don't know if, if people had had a chance to uh, to look at that. Let me see if I can dive into into this and find it. 
Um, were you were you reworking mark, Markdown into the DocuWiki um, uh, markup language, or were you uh, cutting and pasting the Markdown as is and needed to just rework the Markdown? So I, I, I dumped the uh, GitHub to, you know, I exported the Git tree, whatever that mechanism is that GitHub has, and I copied the raw markdown over, and then I had to port, you know, from the hash hash to the equal equal kind of headings and, and things like that. Um, you know, it, like I said, I, I don't have a strong opinion. It, it, it just was not as smooth as I would have liked, and I couldn't, I still don't know how to do things like the, um, you know, in the GitHub markdown, like, you know, uh, back tick, back tick, back tick gives you the, you know the raw, like kind of text output, and and that wasn't compatible with uh, DocuWiki, so I have to go figure out what the syntax is to mark that as raw text and things like that. It it seemed uh, it like I, in the past I've played with things like TWiki and Confluence even, and they they seemed a little bit more natural to me to figure out from just using the interface for two minutes than this did. But like I said, that's not really a fair evaluation because I only looked at it for a minute. Um, but it did seem to be, uh, at least in the form that I was using it, a little bit of work to go from the old format to the new, but maybe there's that module you mentioned that could make that easier. Okay, let me get, let me try to find a link for, for the Markdown uh, documentation and turn that around. Um, the, the, uh, if you go to the wiki page that I migrated, I, I put links to the syntax for each in it. I see. I'll post the uh, page that I ported, the original and the, the, the one I implemented as well. It is a pretty complex page, though, and it does look pretty nice. I mean, this. This. I mean, I'll, I'll. I'll definitely say this. This is better than GitHub uh, wiki. So it. it uh, you know, this has a real. T this has a, a table editor. This uh, has uh, a better navigation mechanism. Um, so this is an. This and uh, this is definitely an improvement in that way. Uh, but like, I don't know if it has, for example, an Emacs plugin or uh, some other things. The other thing I was going to say is just in terms of the 110 things to move, a lot of those are just meeting minutes coming that are essentially cut and pasted from Google Docs. So those should be either really easy to move or, depending on what the, the policy is with meeting minutes, you might not need to move them at all. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, thanks for starting that spreadsheet. Um, I think that'll be key when we start moving some content over. Um, I feel like there's probably still some hesitancy to committing to this. Do we do we want to take another week to to play with it? It's probably good. I, 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 so it sounds like the only choices really we really have without, uh, you know. Uh, asking for some other support, not currently not supported thing is is DocuWiki and Confluence. Is that right, or is there any other options? Those are the uh, those are the two options I have that are um, support. Oh, uh, Todd is MediaWiki available from I, the I, IT department too? Yeah, I believe that was the other one that they would support. I don't I don't have any experience with that, so I. I can't come. I, I, I mean, like I said, my, I don't have a strong opinion. I guess playing with it for another week seems prudent, but I'm sure it's it's fine. We just need to adapt to the new markup style. And if there's an importer function that we can help with the existing pages, that would be awesome. Yeah. So I, I just cut, copied over a URL for a plugin that we do have installed called the the, mark, the PHP Markdown Extra plugin, and it says if you use you know, a, a markdown tag and then a slash markdown tag at the end. Um, the stuff in between those two will be parsed as markdown rather than the, the docu wiki 
format. Um, uh, so I don't know if, if uh, you had seen that when you were starting your, your migration. Cool. I'll take a look. Okay. All right. I would suggest then, Brian, to your to your point that we take another week and do a little bit more exploration and. Um, okay. And I don't think MediaWiki has a mark markdown support. I uh, I think we we gravitated towards this specifically for markdown support. MediaWiki is very sophisticated because it's what's used to support um, the Wikipedia. Uh, uh, so you know that's, that's an option. People want to consider, you know, pipe up now. I just want to get us through this. Okay. okay. All right, let's take another week. And then the last topic is um, communication tools. Well, the second to last topic. All right. Todd, do you want to talk about this course? Yeah, um, just really quickly, uh, as of early this morning, we do have our discourse instance up uh, that we can poke around with. Uh, it is a trial version for several weeks, and we can decide if we want to move forward with that. Um, we just need to go in and do a little bit of configuring, and then we will send the link out to everyone so they can uh, kick the tires of that, and uh, we can regroup next week on any learnings or questions, comments, concerns uh, with that and evaluate just as we are with um, the DocuWiki right now. Okay. Sounds good. And, and, and uh, um, on a um, potential replacement for Slack, um, there's, a, there's a tool called Rocket Chat. Um, you know, some would claim to be a Slack uh, 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 clone. Um, it's open source. It's also something that right now we would probably use as a hosted tool, uh, um, but uh, I'm cutting and pasting a link to a demo to it. Um, uh, if it's something people want to also check out and give an opinion on, um, that would be good. Uh, I, and it's, it's something we'd have to look at, you know, can we integrate it with the Linux Foundation IDs? Can we make sure that we can deploy it in a way that's accessible from China, because for me that's one. The two main things that I'd like to get from a Slack replacement are A, getting past the 10,000 message limit, and B, being able to be accessed from China, which Slack is not. Um, and so uh, Rocket Chat as an open source clone is appealing um, from both those perspectives if they actually need it. Um, actually running it in a hosted environment, we have to see what the business terms on that are. But uh, um, if we like the UI, we can make the case to Linux Foundation IT that they support it. And, uh, um, and potentially move through that. That's the other other stuff. Okay. So just to be sure I'm clear, so we would play around with this hosted version, but if we like it, then basically we're going to look to see if the LFIT staff can host it so that we don't have an archiving issue, right? So, yeah, the, the first step should be evaluate the uh, um, Evaluate the functionality. If we like it, then we will see if Linux Foundation IT will support it. If not, or not on the time frame that we like, then we look at running it in a hosted environment. And Rocket Chat does have a host, you know, the company that makes the open source product also does, you know, provide a hosted platform for it. So mm -hmm. um, we can look at the business terms around that. And if they're not as onerous as Slack, then we can run it. Um, then we can look at I mean, it has to be a decision on our side, I guess. Um, yeah. If those business terms are too onerous, then we have to look at other options. But um, okay. uh, I'll work on the business terms issue as long as others can look at the tool and, and uh, see what they think. That'd be great. Okay. Thanks. So it sounds like people need to get out there and, oh, it's got a cool little, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't go to that site because, oh my god, then you'll just be playing around with the little dots all day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was doing as I was talking to you. <laughs> I just noticed that you could, you could play with them. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next topic then is, uh, thanks Brian, 
the next topic is uh, I just wanted to sort of um, do a, a a reminder to people. So we have the, the Blockchain Explorer project up um, and I think we added three uh, maintainers um, and uh, I think it was one each from Intel, IBM and, and DTCC. Um, but we also put the 2 plus 2 rule on there and um, and so we've had some commits, uh, uh, you know, some chain sets submitted and none of them have ever landed uh, and been uh, reviewed and merged. So. I just uh, what I did was I asked Rye this morning to um, reduce it to non-author uh, core review, um, and uh, which means only one uh, of the maintainers needs to review and approve to get it merged. Obviously, we want to grow that project and grow the set of maintainers for that project over time, but. Um, I had to make that change because otherwise I, I just suspect that we'll be sitting around waiting forever to get code merged rather than actually starting to make some progress. So uh, hopefully it's a temporary thing, but I would just remind uh, all three and anybody actually, you know, to um, uh, to not neglect the, the little the, the baby that we're creating in between uh, the, the Sawtooth Lake and the Hyperledger Fabric projects. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so this really just a, a you know a public service announcement, if you will, to um, to make sure that we're all paying attention and helping to get the thing off the ground. So um, I'll just leave it at that. <clears throat> um, okay. Next up is uh, work group reviews, and the first one is requirements. Hi, good morning. Oh, okay, here. Um, well, um, I've been working on the uh, derivatives use cases, um, pretty much closing up all the uh, financial use cases that we have. Um, I started the discussion on the section in the requirements document as to privacy. Um, so that's uh, that's where we are, pretty much. Um, I'm rallying the group to uh, start writing the main document. Um, and. Um, the progress there has been a little slow. Uh, hopefully, I will get someone to um, help me with um, uh, supply chain use cases and uh, use cases that are not my uh, primary expertise. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm handling most of the financial use cases and uh, tackling privacy and confidential transactions. Okay. Hopefully, I think you know summer is over and everybody's back to school and back to work and. Hopefully the uh, the summer doldrums are over and we can start seeing a lot more um, collaborative contribution. But thank you very much. I hope so. Uh, thank next, you. Next up is uh, Ram. Uh, got a note from Ram. He's out uh, this week. Uh, no significant updates to report, and he will report in on progress uh, next TSC meeting. Okay. Uh, next up is Dave. Uh, hi, yes. Uh, thanks. Uh, yes, the working group, white paper working group met yesterday, and the um, key thing that we discussed was the uh, walkthrough of the white paper. Again, our, you know, our goal is to be able to move out of, remove the draft labeling uh, time for the Cebos um, event, which is at the end of this month. So um, we wanted to be able to have the walkthrough, get everyone, give everyone the opportunity to provide their feedback and input before we do that, before we remove the draft labeling. So um, we we all agree that we're, we will be available a week from yesterday, so next Wednesday um, at uh, 1 p.m. So that was sort of the same time that we originally were planning, I guess, the uh, the virtual um, hack fest before. But, uh, but we're um, reached out to Todd. Uh, hopefully he can help us with the web conferencing and and also, you know, one of the things that we want to make sure that is we get good attendance and, and um, you know, uh, best way to get the word out that this event's going to happen. And uh, and so that that was a key thing. So we're we're aiming to have the white paper walk through next Wednesday. Um, you know, similar to the same format we were doing our meetings here. And uh, that was a key thing. Um, I think that's it. 
I'll get a I'll get a WebEx created for that uh, shortly after this call. If anyone is interested in joining that and wants to get added directly to the WebEx, please just uh, shoot me a note or a chat in the GoToMeeting. Yeah, I hope I can do it, but I'm not positive that I will. I'm doing some sort of a, a talk in Atlanta, and I just don't know what time I'm done. So this is 1 o'clock Eastern? One, 1 o'clock Eastern, but, um, you know, I mean, if I'm, I'm just sort of thinking, oh, I should have, we should have probably discussed this, but maybe, maybe it might be a good idea to put out a little poll to see how many people we could actually get um, on that date, and if and if there's a an alternate date, it's, it's just that we want to get this done, you know, in time that we can um, get the feedback, get the edits in, review them uh, prior to SIBO. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I actually I'm asking for some feedback here. Do you, do you think we should just go ahead and schedule this for 1 p.m. next week, or should we do a poll to find out what would be most convenient for everyone? I, I think you should go ahead um, with as many as we can get. If if it's really lightly attended, then maybe we should try and find another time. Uh, you know, the other alternative, I suppose, would be we have an hour and a half next week on Thursday, and we could take maybe an hour and try and get that use that time for that purpose. Well, so why don't we, why don't we, we go ahead and, and, and we yeah, have, yeah. So, so we could have, we could just schedule it for next Wednesday. We'll do it, and if attendance is particularly light, then we can either, you know, depending on the agenda for next week's um, uh, working uh, TSC meeting, we could either cover some of it there or schedule uh, a follow-up. Um, uh, you know, a day or two later, um, for for people that were unable to attend. Sounds good. So okay. Let's, um, Todd. Let's let's do that. Let's put an hour on the agenda for next week, regardless. And okay, sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, next up is Christopher. holiday maybe okay and then lastly it's uh, CI and that's me um, last week I promised that the build problems <laughs> but they're not um, I think we're still a little bit um, I don't know I think it's getting better but uh, we still have a little bit of flakiness in especially in some of the behave tests and the fabric side I'm um, um, I'm not actually sure, you know, we probably are going to CI and only run them periodically because it's really annoying to have to constantly re-verify because we have um, indeterminate test results. Um, I don't know, Greg. to be uh, WebEx had a hiccup on the audio channel. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry, so what was the question again? Well, I was saying that the behave tests are still really annoyingly flaky. Oh, yeah. And, uh, uh, in the fabric. Uh, and I, I mean, it's almost to the point where it's so annoying that we should maybe just remove them until they can be stabilized. 
Yeah, no, I, I definitely can appreciate the sentiment. Obviously, the, the downside to it is removing it means they'll be even less likely to flush out the issue. But, <laughs> but yeah, right, exactly. Um, I mean, it, when it's at the point that you can't make forward progress, it probably needs to have um, some kind of alternate thing. So I, want, I wonder if I wonder if there's anything we can do in terms of like um, having, you know, I don't I don't know how the the Hyperledger, the, the Linux Foundation's Jenkins setup is, but I know on Jenkins that I've run on my own projects, it's generally fairly flexible in terms of, you know, the the, the type and breadth of jobs you have. So you could have, even though, if, even though we only have one Fabric Git, you could have multiple jobs that do different things in response to changes to Fabric Git. So would it be possible to have kind of like uh, just one job that's looking at the unit test and another one that's looking at behave and at least the behave the, the folks that are impacted by whatever's wrong with Behave would still have that can, that CI benefit, but it wouldn't necessarily block the uh, the the Garrett notion of what's ready to go or something along those lines. I mean, is is the problem is the problem uh, reproducible in local Behave, or or is it only happening in the Jenkins setup? I guess I've it's... noticed I, I've noticed flakiness of some of the. Um, some of the tests, right, um, on both on Jenkins and and locally. I mean, it seems it seems to it's be not that as bad locally because it's only um, you know like ten minutes as opposed right. to a half an hour on Jenkins, but right. Um, I mean, it seems it seems like if there's a test that's notoriously flaky that's reproducible on local, you know, maybe we should just remove that particular test from the mainstream suite. Um, if we're having general problems with behave specifically in Jenkins and not locally, uh, maybe that would be where we consider that that alternate job path to just so that we keep the uh, you know the notion of whether it's working or not available to the people that need to fix it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's the only thing I could think of. I I, I can definitely. I can I can see it go either you know because then the alternative is just leave things the way they are and that motivates people to fix it but at the same time it's painful for everybody else that's not in that path <laughs> to have their their Garrett jobs get a minus one, right? Ben, are you still on? I mean, is there something we can do to? Uh, I mean, I know Jeff is working pretty hard on this, but it just it's it's really painful. Yeah, I'm I'm still on, but I'm I'm not sure what. Uh, I guess uh, some of us need to get together and look at the uh, the problems. Well, some of them have been related to you know bad Ubuntu images or yeah, um, uh, but but there's interspersed with that is a constant steady stream of failing behave tests that. You re you know you rerun them and they run fine so yeah um, it needs some analysis and it needs some attention I think I know Jeff's on vacation this week but maybe we can yeah um, just disable them tip periodically and then uh, get them back in as soon as possible. Um, so have you noticed that it's, it's about timing or or is that trying to uh, get stuff? I haven't the done the deep analysis on the failures to understand other than it's always the same few tests okay. that fail. Um, I haven't really done the analysis to see what's causing the failure other than if it's behave I usually rerun it and if it comes back with success then I know oops and so good. So it just needs a little analysis to figure out which ones are bad, uh, maybe, and to work on getting them stabilized. It could be timing, uh, you know, it, and I don't know why Jenkins is so slow, but like I said, I can run the behave test on my laptop in about 10 minutes, right? Um, and it takes a half an hour or more to run them on Jenkins. So I don't know if it could be a performance thing, but I have noticed that they fail locally as well. So it's not a, just a Jenkins thing.
Okay, uh, yes, uh, we take that up uh, next week when uh, Jeff is back. Okay. Uh, in, right. in the meantime, then, in the meantime, then I guess we, we should disable it. Yeah, so I'll, I'll have Ramesh turn them off until we can have Jeff take a closer look. Yeah. Because it really is starting to slow things down. Um, okay. Um, I guess that's it. Any other items? If not, everybody gets about 15, 20 minutes back, and uh, we'll talk to you all next time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, bye. Bye.